Så det är spelet. Så vi kontinuerar med den här afternoon session. Det är två mer presentationer och den här generella diskussionen i slutet. And uh, we switch to speakers. Uh, now is uh, Arakieta is going to speak and then I'll talk to Lavi. So Arakieta is a multidisciplinary uh, collective um, running collaborative projects and experiments with art, design, architecture, <coughs> and uh, digital media. It's a, it's a pretty big group and we have um, uh, a core group of, uh, of this collective uh, now present. So, uh, Raketa is an NGO operating since the year 2000. Raketa is a meeting place, creating and suggesting temporary meeting places in various forms and formats. In 2012, Raketa attended the climate conference uh, Arctic Frontiers in Tromsø, Norway. The press from Sweden was Raketa Press and Alex Sherialef a journalist and a filmmaker based in Stockholm and working at Swedish public radio Russian Broadcasting. Alex was talking very warmly about his hometown, Arkhangelsk, and we went two years later. And the photos we are showing is from various Raketa projects in a completely mix. House in the forest, the school in between. This is one of uh, Raketa's ongoing project, and this is a project that is mainly taking place in Kenoselsky National Park in the Arkhangelsk Oblast here in Russia. Uh, and like one of the main goals with this project is to create a meeting place, an alternative school, a research center. And the aim is to renovate an old house in a village within the park. And so long, we've been there twice this year, in two, two, one week apart. And, and the group that have been there is a combination of Russians, a Swedish artists, architect, landscape architect, carpenter, arborist, gardener. And on the first trip, it was more like an overview, uh, look like a bird overview to have a understanding of uh, the park and the situation, and the, the landscape, the houses. And during that trip, we were able to take part in a seminar for other national park in Russia that was hosted by the Kanasersky. So then we also had a uh, possibility to go around on different excursion, and we also had some time to found this house that we was looking for to renovate, and we actually found two. And Victor will tell more of those houses later on. Uh, and the second uh, trip was just previous, in the middle of September. And then with us was uh, two professors from Moscow, the Moscow Landscape Architectures, from People's Friendship University, and also for Marhi, the uh, architecture school, and we also have three students with us. And during this week, we make like a closer, uh, um, like a, like a closer view, like on those houses, in various way. Like we we started up with like the whole group were like creating questions that we use during this week. And we try to see those houses like in different layers, like the, the house, we try to divide them like between the house, the side, the, uh, the surrounding, like the village, and also this small village, Filipovskaya, uh, and the world. 
um, um, and also we collected a different kind of materials, both like artifacts from the houses, the surroundings, part from the natures, and and one of those small uh, artifacts that we found in the house was a letter that someone wrote that we don't know who it was. Um, so this is a, a signed letter found in the house on the hill. Hi, Eriska. Found a minute to write you a letter. My life here is perfect. I don't even want to leave. Hello. Uh, I will try to be more practical and uh, to tell you more about uh, the location. So the location is uh, uh, Kinazersky National Park. It's uh, part of Akangesk region and it's very close by to Karelia, uh, Republic of Karelia of Russia. And uh, as Cecilia told, we got two houses from administration of the National Park for restoration and for arranging this uh, school in between. And uh, so first house is located in an abandoned village and uh, it has started to be abandoned because of order of Khrushchev, uh, because of his personal wish of being uh, like of, like of making villages in Russia and Soviet Union to be efficient, uh, effective, and uh, the village has been shuttered. And uh, it's not like alive for maybe the last 20 years, and there is just one summer house in this village. And uh, the other house is a clubhouse in a living village. And, uh, it was an uh, efficient village for quite a long time, and during the Soviet time it has become a village which one is engaged in forestry industry. And uh, in 1990, they have shuttered uh, the whole industry there. And uh, now it's dying and uh, the population has decreased and now there are just 100 people. And uh, we have negotiated with them about the, um, getting access to the clubhouse. And uh, it comes, it can, we can have access and we can do renovation and restoration in different, uh, on different levels. And uh, it also comes that uh, the state, the municipality doesn't care about them and uh, I think uh, this project is the only hope of doing something on a uh, very local level because for new municipalities it's much more easy to shut the road to this village. And uh, as for the title, I want to add uh, some uh, sentences. Uh, the school in between, uh, the idea is to make uh, something on a local level and uh, to escape this uh, capital dimension of Russia, uh, to connect uh, different uh, uh, locations, uh, location, uh, locations or places uh, of Sweden, Finland, for example, Norway and Russia, uh, which are located in Borel or Taiga belt, forest belt, and uh, we are doing it because uh, we have not only this uh, Kinozera Park uh, dimension, we have also a mirror dimension in uh, up in Jämtland in uh, Sweden. And uh, this probably could be mm. that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to begin, or to continue uh, with, the, with the quote from Naomi Klein's latest book, This Changes Everything, uh, where she writes, uh, I'm convinced that climate change represents a historic opportunity on even a greater scale. As part of the project of getting our emissions down to the levels many scientists recommend, we once again have the chance to advance policies that dramatically improve lives, close the gap between rich and poor, create huge numbers of good jobs, and reinvigorate democracy from the ground up. It can disperse power into the hands of the many rather than consolidating it in the hands of the few, and radically expand the commons rather than auctioning it off in pieces. So 
So my part here uh, in Raketa, uh, in this presentation, will be a reflection on Raketa as an inspiration and as a model for women in power, a method and culture to foster social change and the means for a human world. To be in St. Petersburg to talk about Raketa in the context of creative practice as a social agent in Europe and Russia feels perhaps more important than ever. Today in World War III, where over 10 million people are fleeing away from bomb attacks, brutal violence, children are alone running, leaving, running, leaving their mothers and fathers, crossing borders and waters, lonely and traumatized, desperately trying to survive in a world that they didn't choose to come to. This is the consequence of a few men in the world that empower themselves to destroy the world and people's lives. I would like to revisit history in this geographical context and to think about how it has evolved today. After the revolution, which you all know much better about than me, after the revolution 1917, new laws around family and marriage were set in the process of women's liberation. The radical and progressive family politics can be described by its roots in Bolshevik Marxism. They emphasized the process of production as determining women's positions in society. The idea of woman was that she work, be a mother and take care of the family. But clearly, in the capitalist society, women are burdened by the double work duty, which according to the communist ideologist, they could be deliberated from through childcare and more if it was transferred to the public sector. There was awareness and strategies to abolish the patriarchal structure and to empower that men had over women. Alexandra Kolontai was the Soviet regime's first social minister in 1917 and the person behind the new family laws as well as free abortion and more. After conflicts with the regime, Kolontai became a Russian diplomat and, in Stockholm, and placed in Stockholm between 1930 and 1945. And soon she became, became affiliated and a guest teacher at the school Fågelstad Skolan. Stockholm. Kvinnliga medborgarskolan i Fågelstad. Um, women's Citizens. Citizens. Citizens Civic School in Fågelstad. I've had to discuss this translation. Um, started in 1925 and was open until 1945 and held in a mansion in the countryside south of Stockholm. It was run by intellectual women in leading positions in culture and politics, like Elin Wegner, Elisabeth Tam, Ada Nilsson, Honorin, Hermelin, and more women. The foundation of the school was women's rights, concerns about the earth, and peace matters. The goal for the school activities, as well as for these women of Fogelstad, stated in the manifesto is, to seek answers to what kind of society does women want? And in the manifesto, against dictatorship, against violence, against class and race segregation, for democracy, for pacifism, for a society with laws and justice. So let's all think about how would the world look like different if it was led by women? And how would it feel? What would happen to the state and figures of war, violence, rape, domestic violence, poverty, capitalism, segregation, and much more? The point here is not to blame. It's about facts. Raketa for me, a women collective of artists and cultural practitioners and thinkers operating in the realm of peace and in the spirits of Fogelstad Skolan, Pachamama, living as form, etc. and more. These strategies of Raketa, the strategies of Raketa are simple and human. A group of women encountering groups of people or a community in various locations worldwide for dialogues with care and sensitivity in a long-term process 
to build up relationships in domestic and the public sphere, to create meeting places where there is trust and sincere conversations. In these small steps over a longer time frame, by living at sight in periods with these people in collaboration with locals, they build upon personal and collective memory and dreams for the future. What are the consequences of what is happening today for the future? Not only how many lives are taken, but what wounds are created in humanities and culture? How many more times can we repeat this history? And I would like to just end uh, with, with a song by Laurie Anderson, The Dream Before. <coughs> So I should mention that the title of that song is The Dream Before and it's a homage to Walter Benjamin by Laurie Anderson. Thanks. <laughs> 